If you want to talk about wear this hole, strip a car down to its bone and make it stupid fast culture really came from, you have to go back to one man, Colin Chapman. The man was essentially the godfather of the less is more philosophy in motorsport. While everyone else in the 1950s was obsessed with bolting on bigger engines and heavier bodies, Chapman had a different philosophy. Simplify, then add lightness. And here's the thing, this wasn't just a cool catchphrase, it was physics. Let's get nerdy for a bit and talk about Newton's second law. A classic force equals mass times acceleration. If you can't afford to increase force or horsepower in car terms, then play with the other variable, which is mass. Strip the weight off, and suddenly the same power pushes harder. That's why his car, even with small engines, were embarrassing the big boys on track. Also, a big power monster might bully you on the straights. Sure, but a featherweight car is quick everywhere. It's snappy in the straights, glued in the corners, and stomps the brakes like it owes you money. Chapman's first experiment was rough. He literally built a plywood-bodied contraption on top of an old 1930s Austin 7 chassis, which later became the Lotus Mark I. It wasn't pretty, but it proved the point that light cars can handle better, accelerate faster, and feel alive on the road. From there, he continued refining the recipe, introducing the Mark II, Mark III, and the Mark VI kit until he finally hit gold with the Lotus 7 in October 1957. The Lotus 7 was light enough that a modest Ford engine made it feel like a rocket. And here's the genius part. Chapman sold it as a kit car. That meant regular enthusiasts could buy the parts, couple them together in their garages, and avoid the nasty British purchase taxes that applied to fully built cars. Back in the late 1950s, the 7 was a featherweight rocket by the standards of its day, tipping the scales at just 450 to 500 kilograms depending on specifications. The base cars barely scraped 40 horsepower and needed around 16 seconds to hit 100 kilometers per hour, but with a Coventry Climax or Consworth turn motor, you'd be down in the 7 to 9 second bracket. To put that in perspective, that's Medi Cooper S territory, except the Lotus weighed less and cornered like nothing else on the road. Drivers described it like strapping yourself to a go-kart with license plates. So why is all this important? Because the Lotus 7 set the DNA for every EXO car that followed. And without Chapman and the Lotus 7, there probably would be no aerial atom, no EXO motive and no goblin, just heavy cars chasing horsepower. So once Chapman planted the seed with the Lotus 7, car needs everywhere basically got the same crazy idea. What if we just took everything off a car that wasn't 100% necessary? That thought is what gave birth to what we now call exo cars. Now for a long time, exo builds were mostly the domain of backyard fabricators. Dudes with a welder and angle grinder and questionable judgment. But things started shifting in the 2000s. One of the first proper commercially developed EXO cars was the Rocket. Launched in September 2007 by Mills Extreme Vehicles, the Rocket wasn't just some garage hack job, but it was road legal, sold as a kid, and had an actual engineering backbone behind it. What made it wild was that it looked like something out of a video game. Open chassis, exposed suspension arms, and a roll cage you could see from a mile away. But under that skeletal frame was an engine screaming at high RPMs, delivering the kind of power-to-weight ratio you'd normally find it in exotic supercars. From there, the trend snowballed. Car culture outlets started defining and celebrating the EXO movement, where you'd be left with an aggressive-looking machine that's more of a roller coaster than an automobile. So is it minimalist? Absolutely. Sketchy? Sometimes. Fun? Always. Then you had the aerial Atom. If the Lotus 7 was the grandfather of the movement, the Atom was the rebellious grandson who showed up in the early 2000s and said, Watch this! Built on a tubular exoskeleton frame, powered by Honda's legendary K20 turbo motor, the Atom pushed the exo philosophy into the mainstream. Zero to 60 in under 3 seconds, faster than most hypercars of its era. And it looked like a giant go-kart on steroids. Fast forward to today, and EXO cars have carved out their own little corner of car culture. Equal parts respected, feared, and laughed at by people who don't get it. The mainstream might chase SUVs and touchscreens, but the EXO cars are still doing what they have done since they were
produce humiliate machines that cost 10 times as much. Now, if you thought Exil cars were wild on the street, wait until you see what happens when people take the skeletonized madness off-road. Because yeah, it's not just about gaping supercars at traffic lights. Some builders looked at a roll cage on wheels and thought, why not make it a dune buggy that can yeet itself over sand dunes? Enter companies like Exil Motive, which don't just sell sleek track toys. They push the concept into the dirt with off-road Exo builds. Imagine the same bare bones and lightweight chassis you'd expect, but now jacked up with lifted suspensions, reinforced shocks, and a wide track that can chew through ruts and bumps without folding in half. These things are built to launch off jumps and blast through mud. But here's the fun part. The off-road XO formula means you don't need a monster engine to have a good time. Drop a Mazda Miata drivetrain into a tube frame with basically no bodywork, add big knobby tires, and suddenly you have a desert toy that can out-hustle traditional buggies. Culturally, this is where XO cars and dune buggies intersect. The VW Beetle dune buggy, seen of the 60s and 70s, was built on the same principle. Strip it, cage it, and make it light. Exomotive just brought that ethos into the modern era with precise engineering and a platform design from the ground up for chaos. Another company dealing with Exo cars is Duo Exo. They're small, Brazilian, and honestly, the cars look like formula machines that escaped into the paddock. Every build screams track day only, with sharp angles, no frills, and no cushy interiors. Now, roll over to the Polaris Slingshot. Yeah, it's got three wheels, but don't you dare call it some quirky Chrysler prototype. This thing is a street-legal UFO on asphalt. Imagine a go-kart that went through puberty, got an engine stuffed in its chest, and then bullied its way onto the highway. Barely any bodywork, motorcycle-style licensing in some states. And hearing that's more pogo stick than car. Then we've got Texas pride in the form of the DF Goblin. Born from Chevy Cobalt donor cars, this kid is basically redneck engineering meets NASA skeleton frame. You tear down a regular commuter, toss the boring bits, and rebuild it into a cage on wheels. Finally, we have the VW Beetle Dune Buggy, just like I said earlier, led by legends like Myers Makes, who were already doing EXO before it was cool. With fiberglass shells, no doors, no roof, back in the 60s, they turned beetles into sand-flinging party machines. A culture never died. The new Myers makes even dropped an electric buggy so you can silently terrorize the dunes while sipping coconut water. Here's a cold shower moment. In the U.S., you can pretty much bolt some wheels on a lawn chair, slap on a VIN from a donor Miata, and depending on your state, walk out of the DMV with plates. But the moment you cross the Atlantic, it's a whole different story. The EU isn't playing around with cars that look like they crawled out of a shed. Safety rules, emissions, paperwork, yeah, good luck. That's why EXO cars over there don't bother pretending. On the road, they're ghosts, but on the track is where they show teeth. Light, raw, stripped to the bone, these things turn every lap into a cage fight with physics. Honestly, that's the only stage they need. Forget the idea that Europe's shutting the door on exocars because the Atom 4RR laughs at it. This thing isn't just a weekend toy. It's a 525 horsepower missile weighing 680 kilos, fully road legal, and savage enough to make a 911 turbo look like it's on training wheels. All right, let's pump the brakes on the hype for a second. Exocars look like the ultimate cheat code. And here's the part most people don't talk about. They can also be rolling death traps if built wrong. See, a proper exocar isn't just a skeleton with an engine stuffed in. A space frame is literally the backbone of the whole machine. Every weld, every joint, and every piece of tubing is carrying stress loads from acceleration, braking, cornering, and even just sitting inside the vehicle. Mess it up and you gamble with your life. Without proper reinforcement, a miscut tube or bad heat-affected weld can buckle in a heartbeat. With no real bodywork, these cars punch a fat hole through the air. So top speeds take a hit. And without wings and splitters doing their thing, high speed, stability, and handling can get sketchy. You'll rock it off the line, and once you're pushing triple digits, the car starts feeling less like a scalpel and more like a shopping cart with a jet engine strapped to it. So yeah, building an Exio car is tempting, but don't confuse stripping down with simple. Chapman could make lightness work because he was a genius engineer. Mr. X with a Harbor Freight welder isn't Chapman. If you're going to play this game, get the frame design right and don't skimp on materials. Otherwise, that dream machine turns into a physics lesson you really don't want to learn the hard way. 
And hey, if you've ridden along this far, we're just getting warmed up. From old timers to supercars to wild exo toys that look like science projects gone wrong, we cover it all. Hit that subscribe button and let's keep chasing every crazy machine that makes driving worth it. Remember, any car which holds together for more than a whole race is too heavy.